Okay, so um, hopefully you read the emails, uh, but I sent around uh, the first set of shoot. Okay. So first set of papers. Uh, so, uh, she, who's she is all? You, okay, cool. So, so basically what I'm doing is I'm kind of alternating between the alphabetical end and beginning. Okay, so that's going to be the order so you can figure out your order. Okay, so, uh, uh, so the three papers kind of roughly relate to the beginning part of uh, the, so, uh, the first paper is on uh, what are called as uh, backscatter radios. So these are radios which, instead of generating their own uh, uh, carrier energy, uh, they basically rely on modulating a carrier that they pick up from the environment. Okay, so like for example, it could be the receiver sending a carrier wave, which the transmit, uh, which the node which needs to transmit. Uh, is going to modulate. So it kind of changes the radio model that we talked about because if you recall in the in our radio model the transmitter had the distance dependent energy component and that that is because the transmitter is generating the radio energy, the radio the energy behind the radio waves which is which sort of carries through. But if instead we are picking things up from the ambient then uh, a lot of things sort of Basic, basically, a kind of the transmission becomes a lot cheaper, and the second thing is the balance between computing and communication uh, ends up changing, and that has its consequences. So, this paper from last year, uh, Mobicom kind of touched upon that in context of sensor nets. This whole area of uh, sort of uh, harvesting radio energy uh, from signals which are already around us, um, TV station signals or stuff like that is pretty hot. There's few groups, one at University of Massachusetts Amherst, which is this paper from, and one from University of Washington, Seattle. Uh, they're pretty active in this, and in fact, at this stage, uh, the group at um, Seattle, for example, have devices which are battery-less. So not only do they modulate the signal which is which they discover in the surrounding, but they actually also scavenge energy from them. This particular paper doesn't do it, but uh, sort of uh, these battery-less things. So literally, you have devices which have processor radios and all, except that they have no battery. They uh, can, can conceptually kind of last forever. Anyway, the second paper is from Census, which is one of the uh, top sensor, sensor networking conferences. And this paper is on um, essentially analyzing application level uh, uh, performance in free roaming smartphones. So essentially, kind of they make some hardware unit so that then they can keep monitoring stuff as you're using your phones and also I thought that would kind of give a perspective on. And the third one is, uh, as we kind of talked about, one of the reasons we do low power design and all is a heat issue. And that kind of cries out for, can we not use this heat to uh, for beneficial usage? So one of the things that's currently kind of uh, a lot of people in the chip level exploring is that could we make use of the difference between temperature, for example, or essentially take that heat energy and then use that to power the chip conceptually, okay, or use that to power the cooling uh, system. So essentially recycle heat, and uh, that's kind of a concept. So this paper out of Georgia Tech uh, got the best paper award at this conference called International Symposium on Low Power Electronics and Design. It's kind of a main conference focused on low power. Um, so uh, that's this one. This particular paper I, I could only find from the ACM website. So when you follow this link, you have to be on the UCLA network or VPN. Okay, so just now, what do I expect? Okay, so uh, this assignment is now also an assignment on CCLE, uh, it's kind of the official course website, um, with a deadline of noon on Thursday. So we'll always set it at noon of the day uh, of the presentation so that's next Thursday and uh, you have you you, are, you you can upload three PDF files because there are three papers so uh, and I've given a link to a template the cover page of the template kind of gives you instructions on uh, 
uh, how to name the file and stuff like that and uh, so you kind of just follow that. Uh, yeah, so everyone has to fill out the four slides which are there which basically summarize strengths, weakness, what do you think can be done uh, on top of this. Uh, but of course the designated speaker in addition also has to prepare the slide set. Now when it comes to preparing the slide set, I'm perfectly fine if you approach the authors or maybe you even are able to find the slides on the, uh, on the website. Sometimes if you just Google with the title of the paper and PPT, uh, these authors go around giving talks all, all, all sort of places and all. That's perfectly fine with me, but again the expectation is that you are presenting the paper from your perspective, not repeating the author. So what I'm trying to say is the authors obviously are going to put their work in the most positive light and gloss over kind of things which are obviously negative or even kind of. so I expect that you'll go beyond that so it's perfectly fine to use the slides they should be clearly identifiable like put some things like from the author or something like that but then kind of at least wrap your own story around it okay so uh, just 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 kind of make sure of that so uh, that's where we are going to be again let's see what's the count today four nine or 13 okay so I guess there are some three students who uh, who are still enrolled but are not in the class okay so anyway um, uh, we'll kind of do uh, I guess for the rest of the quarter maybe once a week basically uh, session like this okay uh, aim for a 20 minute presentation and then I'll call upon one of the other students to lead the discussion. Okay, so that's how it's going to work. Um, questions? Okay, and again, I'll give basically a week's sort of at, uh, at, at least a week's notice so that you have uh, time to prepare and go through it. Okay. So that takes care of. So the next topic I want to move over to is power management and uh, actually I'm going to come back to uh, more uh, discussion on some of the more recent developments and some of the things that I've already covered. Uh, so I'm going to come back to that but I want to also be, uh, sort of go ahead and give a complete uh, picture of what happens uh, when it comes to low power computing. So. Uh, what we have seen thus far basically is where the energy comes from, what are the non idealities and all in that process, and how can we model where the energy is consumed. We looked at CPU, we looked at displays, we looked at uh, um, uh, the radio side of things, and of course there are other elements, memory and things like that, but uh, which may be through papers, maybe through uh, in future lectures I'll cover. So the topic I wanted to move is that, okay, given these things, how do we manage uh, for power, okay? And of course, one perspective is let's design things to be lower power, okay? So hardware or software, which is intrinsically power efficient. Uh, but as we all know that our computing systems kind of vary quite a bit in terms of their workload and ambient environment and all. So not everything can be just statically designed. Oftentimes, it's really a case of runtime management that one has to follow. Uh, and ideally kind of, uh, in general you would have both sides of the coin. You design things to be power efficient and then you're going to subsequently manage so that um, energy is kind of a resource that you are managing. So those of you who are in my 202A, you kind of, we looked at like how we can manage for uh, resources to meet some time constraints and all. Now you can imagine we can manage things to meet certain power requirements. So to understand that, and again, we sort of focus for now on digital hardware, uh, CPUs kind of things and all. So our good old equation on where the power goes. So uh, three, several components. So there is the dynamic power, there is, which is uh, or kind of the switching power. Just, yeah, okay. uh, so there is a switching power, there is a sh short circuit current, there is a leakage, and then there is kind of a rest. And, uh, active power kind of while you are, uh, while the system is actively doing some work consists of all of these things, but when the system is in the standby, then the first two terms are going to disappear because 
essentially I if I'm not doing anything then there are no changes taking place no gate is changing state so the first two terms are going to disappear and then we only are left with the leakage and then finally if we actually power down then uh, these things will obviously all all disappear now we uh, so what this kind of leads to is uh, sort of at a very high level a few different ways we could go around managing this so let's start with um, uh, so, so this term is very uh, relatively small so we can kind of forget about it. When it comes to the leakage, really kind of the only thing we have in our arsenal is to power off, okay? Either that or if you are, uh, so essentially that motivates towards run to completion quickly and shut down. So really kind of the stuff that we can do otherwise is uh, in this area, which is the uh, switching power consumption. So if you look at this term, uh, there are a few things you might imagine one could do. So one is uh, I, uh, there's a dependency on voltage squared, so that's uh, very uh, attractive because if we can reduce the voltage, I can uh, significantly impact the power. But reducing voltage comes at the cost of things slowing down. So uh, my overall uh, area under the curve may actually actually be worse off. So from an energy perspective, while I can lower the power arbitrarily, but if I'm worried about energy, then the slowdown may more than uh, compens more than overwhelm the gain in P that we are getting, and then we may worse off. But uh, then perhaps we could re uh, compensate for it by playing tricks at the architecture level. So like, for example, I could increase concurrency in the algorithm, concurrency in the hardware, pipelining, parallelism, multiple cores, all those kind of things. So, so, uh, so essentially you can imagine what I can do then is reduce V and then do things, uh, since reducing V is going to reduce the maximum frequency that the particular hardware can sustain. So then I can compensate for it by having more copies of the hardware or pipelining it so that for the same frequency I can have more work done. So uh, and the idea is that in these kind of applications uh, generally speaking only throughput is important because latency is going to go up because a given piece of hardware is slowing down and if you have limited ability to parallelize then uh, they're going to slow down. So generally speaking these things work well where either uh, you have pretty a lot of tolerance of latency. So for example, applications where some degree of slowdown may still be okay from human perceptual perspective and also uh, a lot of speech, video, those kind of things fall into that category. And also where only rate is important. So like a lot of servers and all are designed like that. The throughput is important and it's not necessarily the time to respond to a single, single task. So I could do that. So reduce V, play these games. Second thing I can do is reduce alpha C term. Now alpha C is basically, it has two terms, both of which are really kind of in a way design time terms. So capacitance is basically saying something about uh, the quality of the hardware and alpha is saying how much that capacitance is being switched and that perhaps is saying something about the quality of your architecture or, or your algorithms. Some algorithms may be may require more instructions, maybe require more switching of the nodes in the hardware. So all of this thing is really kind of boils down to an energy efficient implementation, uh, energy efficient hardware, energy efficient algorithms, energy efficient sort of operating system, things like that. So that's the alpha C term. This is more of a design time trick. And the final thing is that surest way of reducing power is that if I don't need to do anything, then I can shut things down. So in many applications, so the system proceeds like some event comes, the system processes it, and then waits for the next event. And in fact, most embedded systems and a lot of interactive systems are of that nature. So they are event driven. And in these cases, latency to some extent is important. So you have to respond in a timely enough fashion. So kind of the idea is then uh, we, whenever the event comes, we execute it perhaps execute it quickly. Uh, so we either uh, power the system up if it was off, increase the frequency if it was too slow, we kind of do all of that. And then when it becomes inactive, then we lower the frequency, lower the voltage. Uh, and uh, of course, 
reviving the system may incur a cost. So we have to make a judicious decision about should we shut down because if we shut down and then again have to be woken up immediately, then that, that would only hurt the performance of the system and perhaps even cost uh, extra energy wasted. So for certain kind of system, this technique is going to sort of work out, work out well. So this is clearly mostly a design time consideration, although uh, you could imagine runtime ways of also affecting alpha C uh, terms. So for example, if you have reconfigurable type hardware, uh, or maybe you have hardware has, uh, your hardware is designed to have multiple different versions, you can activate, deactivate different versions depending upon which state your algorithm currently is in. So like for example, uh, after you have looked at the data, you realize that, you know, uh, for this particular case, it would be more efficient for me to use uh, algorithm number one or CPU number one because it has some special support for it. So I can I can optimize things at runtime even with this. But most of our uh, interest, we are going to look at the first and the third. So in case of first, the story is how can I recompense, how can I compensate for the slowdown? so that overall we come out ahead in power. Of course, we are ignoring the issue out here that that slowdown may cause more energy being consumed because of the leakage, so we have to revisit that. And here we are going to look at how can we, how can we design policies uh, that would let us uh, shut down in, a, in some sort of an optimal fashion so that we come out ahead in this game uh, because there are costs associated with sweeping in. Right? So as an aside, where do you think, uh, let's look at this one. So uh, this issue of shutting down, waking up, where do you think in the system stack this should be done? Like, is it application's responsibility? Is it compiler? Is it operating system? Should it be the hardware? Um, where would it be best done? And Something pretty close to the hardware, maybe when there's an interrupt from the sensor, that's a really heavy event. So, 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 so how would you set it? Let's say you're designing a system, so, and you want to say, you want to design it so that you shut it down, let's say power it off, uh, whenever there is nothing to do, right? Okay. So when you say you want to do it in the hardware, what does that mean? So let's think concretely. Let's say you have a CPU. Okay. So can the CPU know that there is nothing to do? Okay, so uh, uh, let, let's let's finish with that. Okay, we'll, let's talk about each one of these possible layers. Okay, so so hardware obviously the advantage is it can do it very quickly, very efficiently because ultimately it's the hardware that needs to be shut off. Uh, question becomes: Can the hardware know that there is nothing to do? Now, let's say it's a CPU. You could imagine that the CPU can see there is nothing to do for at least parts of it. So let's say, for example, if the CPU has a floating point unit and it knows that there are no upcoming floating point instructions, it can shut down the floating point unit, okay? So that kind of stuff it can do potentially. Um, and it is done. What they do is they just stop the clock to the floating point. But if the cost of, uh, and that can work for these tiny little pieces of circuit, but if you were to power off, the CPU has limited insight into what's going to happen beyond the immediate instruction buffer. So there's a buffer of instructions which lets you know what is coming. Uh, and perhaps you may even know that there are no instructions. Maybe there is a special instruction in the, uh, that if, if, if that instruction queue is empty, then you know that perhaps I can shut things down. Uh, but limited visibility. CPU doesn't know what's happening. So now going to ARM's point, which is all the way up, Application. So application certainly knows what it needs, right? Um, uh, application knows what resources need to be kept up, uh, what are truly needed because it knows about the user state and also that's a great, that's a good point. Uh, the problem is there are not, there's not just one application, there are multiple applications. Uh, so one application may say keep uh, keep this thing up, the other application may be saying exactly the opposite. So some something needs to reconcile uh, these conflicting things. 
So, what else is you're doing? Okay, OS layer. So, let's talk about OS layer. So, OS layer is, uh, uh, is in the middle, obviously, so that seems potentially attractive. Of course, it knows less about the application, so application has to somehow convey all its interest and it's somewhat farther removed from the hardware, so uh, things which should be very rapidly woken up to sleep will be too heavyweight with the OS. So the reality is all these layers try to put their finger into the pie, okay? And I guess depending upon which uh, community you come from, everyone kind of tries these things, and I forgot the compiler, so what people also do is uh, write, uh, uh, sort of at compile time, uh, put specific instructions and all into this thing. But generally speaking, the dominant place where the kind of techniques I'm talking about on this side uh, get manifested is the OS because sort of the sweet spot. It can interact with the applications and still have some application level knowledge and still have global knowledge what's happening across applications and at the same time is close enough to the hardware to make things kind of happen. So it's either the OS or kind of what is called as Funware or HAL or BIOS. So it's somewhere in that territory where you would often see power management, uh, power management being implemented. But hardware certainly and application also get engaged. Okay, so these are, these are not, uh, but, but the, uh, being at the extremes, it's a little bit harder for them to sort of pull this thing up. Now, the, for any of these things to work, the other, besides affecting the shutdown, we also would need to know how much power am I consuming and these kind of things, okay? And that certainly sort of hardware, hardware has to do. So hardware, modern hardware provide lots of support for power management, but usually the decision whether to shut down, what to shut down and all is best done at something in the operating system layer. It could be device drivers, could be the scheduler, could be some combination of these. So let's start with a design time perspective. So uh, I want to design hardware which is ex energy efficient. And some of what I'm presenting is uh, kind of a classical picture. Uh, in perhaps next week, I'm going to talk about what kind of things currently are going on in this space. Uh, but this will give you kind of more of a uh, foundational picture of how sort of people thought about this. So basic idea is voltage had the square dependence. And in fact, if you, if we actually go back out here, uh, uh, if you look at the frequency, frequency is the inverse of delay, right? So whatever is the delay through the a gate, the frequency is going to be the inverse of that. And the gate delay goes up as voltage goes down, or another way of saying is frequency is roughly proportional to voltage, first order, okay? And therefore, really what, actually, if you think it is a power, we really have a cubic dependence uh, potentially. So that's a very attractive place to focus on. So idea is, and we operate at a reduced voltage. As I reduce the voltage, the maximum possible frequency is going to go down. So therefore, if I was operating at the F max, I'm going to have to reduce the frequency. So I'll have to op I'll operate at a lower speed. To compensate for the lower speed, we do some architecture optimization. By architecture, I also include algorithm. So it could be optimization of the hardware, but it could also be optimization of, uh, sort of algorithms and all what you're using. So I do something to compensate for that slower operation. So for example, make use parallelism, do pipelining, with some combination of hardware and compiler or software techniques. So, and as long as I can do that uh, compensation more efficiently, then the slowdown that is happening, I'll come out ahead. Unfortunately, what will happen at, at some stage, those techniques will run out of steam and therefore I'll begin to see more and more overhead uh, and that will eliminate this advantage. So you could imagine that I can play this game a little bit and then eventually sort of it will kind of separate. You could uh, do the same concept for a lot of any, uh, any system where there exists some analog of this, that is there is some knob that I have which uh, which gives me some sort of interesting trade-off against power. In particular, 
the strong result is any time the power versus the relationship with that knob is a convex curve, then I can always come out ahead by uh, playing the slowdown game. Uh, what is convex curve? Anything? bulges down okay uh, so so v square is like that i mean this is parabolic right uh, but you could imagine other systems where i have some knob it could be like just to throw an example at you uh, in radios the modulation which is how many bits i sent for symbol that relationship is convex okay and there are many other systems where there are similar convex relationships that exist, okay? And intuitively what it means is that instead of operating at, uh, if I focus on any segment of the curve, instead of operating at the extreme, if I were to operate at somewhere in the middle, since the curve is bulging down, I'm gonna come out ahead. So anytime I have a system where the relationship between power and some variable that I can exercise control over is a convex system, then, uh, similar concepts will apply. So actually the same thing works on memory, works for my already alluded to radios and many other cases where kind of you would see that these kind of relationship, that convex relationship exists. So what's happening is typically uh, I'll have to trade off power against something, nothing comes for free. And uh, when it comes to designing hardware, usually that trade off often ends up being against area, but it could be other things like against latency, against some other characteristic. So let's see how it works out. So if I have a processor, then um, this is for some old CMOS technology, but all this is showing is how the speed of, or rather the delay of a particular gate changes uh, with voltage. So as the voltage reduces, the drive of the gate goes down and then the delay kind of goes up, okay? And it goes up more and more rapidly and the closer you come to this magical threshold voltage, the kind of delay keeps going up. So that's, that's just the technology characteristic. On this side, what you have is, let's say I'm using parallelism as my uh, preferred technique. So as I parallelize, so as I throw more hardware at it, let's imagine more cores at it, so more CPU cores. So as I'm throwing more CPU cores at it, I'm going to get some speed up. Now, if I have a well-designed system, uh, I'll hopefully get a linear speed up. Occasionally, I may even get super linear speed up. There are some cases where because as I'm adding more processors, I'm also adding more cache and therefore memory uh, data which was sitting far away in a slow, uh, far away memory is now all close to the CPU. So I may actually even see occasionally super linear speed up. But generally what happens is uh, I get this grouping down kind of an effect because the algorithms cannot be arbitrarily parallelized. Anyone heard of Amdahl's law? Okay, so computing and E are full of all these weird laws. Amdahl's law basically say if I have a program, then it has some parallelizable part and some serial part or sequential part. I can infinitely parallelize and I, my speed up would still be limited by kind of the sequential part. So if I were to look at the speed up, it's going to droop down. But there are a variety of other reasons. At some stage, the cost of communicating between things which have been divided are going to uh, begin to eat up. So realistically, systems kind of would have some sort of behavior like this. And kind of the idea then is that uh, if if I had a ideal speed up, we're going to come back to this. But the idea is that normally, let's say we are operating at a speed up of one with one unit of hardware, and let's say we want to supply voltage of three volts. And then what we are going to do is we are going to increase the parallelism. That parallelism causes the speed up, and that speed up I can compensate against the equivalent amount of slowdown, and therefore operate it as a reduced voltage. So my overall throughput would be the same, but I would be operating at a lower voltage. And given the shapes of the curve, it turns out that you would be ahead. That is, uh, I have more processors, but each processor is consuming less power, and it turns it, it's consuming more or less power than the increase in number of processors. So we kind of come out ahead. So let's take an example. Let's say uh, I have some sort of simple data path. So these are registers, this is an atom, this is a comparator. This is just meant to be something arbitrary. Um, 
So what's happening is every clock tick, a new piece of data comes and some computation happens and its output goes out. So let's imagine again for the sake of argument how processes play out at the hardware level. Let's say these guys have some take some time which adds up to 25 nanoseconds. So I can feed new data to it every clock tick corresponding to 40 seconds. So these 25 nanoseconds, new data comes, executes, uh, next clock again starts working. Let's imagine that I can implement this thing with some particular amount of capacitance and I operate at some particular voltage. So using a CB square F, I have kind of the baseline case. What I can then do is I can use two copies of it and uh, then what I can do is every odd sample I can send to the upper data path, every even sample I can send to the lower data path and I can reassemble the results back. So each data path is now operating at half the speed but since I have two data paths, the overall throughput is going to be the same. Uh, so I have uh, the data paths now operating at 20 megahertz and therefore I can change the voltage so that the frequency is now reduced to 20 megahertz because all I need now is a frequency of 20 megahertz. So I can reduce the voltage and uh, since I have two data paths, I will have at least twice the capacitance and then a little bit more because I have to pay for all this reassembly circuitry. So uh, uh, this, uh, the place where I lifted this example from, so in their particular case what they did was they were implementing these things as an actual chip layout and uh, so it turns out that the capacitance in, instead of being twice the original it is another 7-8% more, so 2.15. Uh, voltage could be reduced by 1.7 uh, because I have two data paths. I can operate at half the speed, uh, so a reduction of 1.7. You combine all of this, the main thing is the help we get from the square term and the fact that the frequency also is half. All of this results in the power of this new hardware being 0.36 PREF. So we have gained roughly a th one, uh, we have factor of three in power consumption uh, at the same throughput. That's an important point. My, the rate at which I'm processing is the same. Uh, area clearly has gone up and what else have I sacrificed? Or have I sacrificed anything? More complex. Okay, more complex but some something more metric. Yeah, it's the same thing. After I present a data item to it, when is the result available for that data item? In the previous case, it was available 25 nanosecond data, right? In this case, huh? well, I'm clocking it at half the clock rate now, right? So I'm clocking it with a so it's really 50 nanosecond now, right? So it was 25 earlier, 50. So the latency went up, right? So so every clock tick I'm processing, uh, uh, since these things are operating at, uh, I, I can I can alternate uh, operation out here, but each one of these data paths is half the speed. So when I present a value to it, it will take it's 50 nanoseconds. So conceptually what's happening is instead of a CPU which was of a certain speed, I have now two CPUs of half the speed and what I'm doing is um, I have a queue of tasks coming in. Uh, originally I was presenting the task to that one fast CPU and therefore uh, it had less time to handle each task. Now I'm sending or task to one CPU, even task to another CPU, and each one of them is operating at half the speed. So they will process the task at uh, with twice the delay, and therefore the delay went up, or latency went up. Okay. And that may or may not be an issue in many applications. This tiny increase of delay may be uh, so little relative to overall end-to-end -end delay that who cares? Uh, but in other cases, it might might be an issue. 
So parallelism works out, and as you can see, uh, if I keep parallelizing more, things will get more complicated or whatnot. But the main thing is this overhead at some stage will start coming up. Okay, at least thus far it seemed to work fine. The other way we are always taught to speed things up is to pan, uh, to pipeline. So back in early 2005, frames CPUs began to get pipeline more and more deeply because that was one of the ways uh, we could get more speed up. So a lot of work in computer architecture at that time advocated we should go to like 12 stage pipeline, 16 stage pipeline, 20 stage pipeline. So very deep pipeline stages in order to uh, get uh, power efficient speed ups and all. Okay. So, uh, so that's kind of the next approach then. So pipelining. So the way pipelining works is we add additional stages of pipeline. And therefore, what is happening is that each pipeline stage, uh, uh, a, a clock cycle or the speed at which I can speed things are not decided by uh, smaller amounts of delays. So in this particular example, what is happening is I have introduced one stage of pipeline. So I'm still going to operate this thing at uh, same frequency as before. So I can keep pumping the data at F ref. Uh, so that remains unchanged. Uh, but uh, to sustain that clock frequency, I only have to worry about the delay to the adder or delay to the comparator, not the sum of the two. So that means that I can operate the adder or the comparator, think of them as processors, at a slower at a slower clock, uh, slow lower voltage, because previously this delay plus this delay had to add up to 25 nanoseconds. Now only this delay needs to add up to 25 nanoseconds. So just the comparator has a delay budget of 25 nanoseconds, whereas previously comparator plus adder had a delay budget of 25 nanoseconds. So that means that any individual hardware in this example can now be a uh, factor of two slower. And therefore, uh, we can operate it at a lower, lower voltage. So again, in this case, the same is a same voltage. We'll pay, because of this pipeline, and we'll pay some overhead for that. So in this particular example, then, we have uh, frequency to be the same. Capacitance went up a little bit because of the addition of these pipeline registers. And then we have this um, reduction in voltage because I can afford each component to be slower. So voltage can be dropped uh, while we maintain the original throughput because our system frequency is still at rest. Uh, we plug the numbers in and turns out in this particular case also roughly uh, factor of three reduction. The part that it is very close reduction is coincidental, uh, but point is that uh, there is reduction. Now, as I keep pipelining deeper and deeper and deeper, we uh, we can have issues. So, for example, can, can I can I pipeline arbitrarily more? Not really, because at some stage I'll have to begin to pipeline inside the adder or inside the comparator, and that won't be possible. So, I cannot, or if you think in terms of processing tasks and all, I cannot arbitrarily pipeline uh, because there are essentially you have certain tasks which cannot be split up or certain hardware which cannot be split up. Uh, but to the extent you can, this sort of again uh, is kind of a viable, uh, viable strategy. And even though I'm kind of using adders and comparators as an example, uh, hopefully you're able to kind of make that leap of faith. That, uh, the same concept applies at any scale. I mean, these things could just be processors and doing some tasks. True, absolutely. So every time I'm adding a pipeline stage, they are also adding certain amount of delay, okay, which is uh, which is effectively another way of saying is that I cannot really slow it down by factor of two. I'll have to slow it down a little bit less because some amount of my delay is going to be eaten up by these pipeline stages I have added, okay. So the actual reduction in voltage cannot be this much, maybe it will be a little bit less. Okay, good point. Uh, what trade-offs am I making? Again, obviously, I'm increasing the area. Not so much as before, but certainly we're increasing the area. Um, uh, what about latency? What's happening with latency in this case? So if I think in terms of when I presented the data out here, originally it would have appeared 50 nanoseconds later out here. Now, each one of these stages is 50 nanoseconds. 
So in this case, it will appear 100 nanosecond later out here. Okay. So, so again, latency goes up. So throughput remains the same. Latency goes up. Area goes up. And uh, go ahead. Okay. So here, every 25 nanoseconds, you're right. Every 25 nanoseconds, okay. So and I can combine these things. I can pipeline and parallelize and stuff like that. And all. Uh, get more reduction, but eventually this is going to saturate. So this approach, uh, in its static form, as in I'm designing a chip, I'm designing a board or whatever, and I can apply this kind of thing, uh, came into being uh, early 90s. Actually, sort of the group which uh, sort of uh, created this thing very heavily was kind of the group I was doing my PhD work in. So, so not I, but sort of my cubicle mates and all uh, were the one who were driving this approach quite extensively. Caught on quite a bit. It was a static approach. Still had limitations in the sense that uh, we're talking about now this magical new values of voltage and all, but rest of the world still speaks certain standard voltages. So while you can do all of this stuff internal to your chip, you cannot talk to others. So at sort of electrical systems are designed to talk at certain standard voltages. Uh, so that was that's the issue. You also need to generate these voltages. Also, the optimum voltage may be different for different chips. So there are all sort of practical things, but nevertheless, if I'm designing a large chip uh, fully under my control, then this strategy was good. Later on, uh, like 2000 time frame or so, uh, a more dynamic version of this also start became feasible, which is I can change these voltages and all on, on the fly potentially, okay, and uh, so kind of uh, at some times, my system is operating at a higher frequency, higher voltage, at others, at lower frequency, lower voltage. So, we're going to talk about that later, but this picture is purely a static one that while design time, what can you do? Um, now, going back to uh, uh, the plot we had earlier, which is normalized power versus number of processors and how the delay is increasing. Uh, same strategy you can imagine that what will happen is as I increase number of processors, I get uh, an increase, so going back out here, so the clearer slide, as I increase number of processors, I am getting some architectural speed up, but my power consumption is going up by factor of n, but then uh, because I am getting an architectural speed up, I can slow down each processor by the same factor, and therefore I can uh, reduce the voltage, and that voltage gain turns out to Compens uh, more than compensate. So you end up with sort of a curve like this. That is, if I look at normalized power versus number of processors, then as I increase the number of processors, the overall system power goes down. Okay, so I, instead of one fast processor, I have many slower processors. And, but eventually at some stage it starts sort of at plateaus and I guess if you go further, it might even creep back up. And this actually is the whole rationale behind multi-core. Uh, uh, so I said that, uh, so, so if you go, uh, that um, from processor architecture perspective, people are going to talk about very deep pipeline processors, processors where instructions are 12 stages, 15 stages pipeline, okay? What's the problem with that? What's the problem with having very deeply pipeline processors? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, so, so there are dependencies in the instruction and particularly when you are doing jumps and stuff like that, you may have problems that you have already started executing future instructions. So that's work you have done, but you are going to discard, okay? So uh, in pipeline processors, oftentimes they create this deliberate bubble, which is there is a null instruction after, uh, after the jump instruction, okay? Which is just inserted by the hardware itself. Uh, but if you have a very deep pipeline, you are going to essentially stall the processor for 
many, many cycles, okay, which is not very efficient. So pipelining has its problem. Parallelism has its own well-known problem. It's, very, it's not easy to parallelize instructions. So parallelism can come in a couple of different ways. One is within a processor, so you can have multiple instruction execute, execution units, which is called what? Superscalar processors. So I can have that. Or I can have multiple cores, in which case I have to split my program. Uh, but all of these things come with overhead and all. But the motivation underlying all of these was fundamentally kind of the same, which is our approach of just taking a uh, single processor which were uh, and keep pushing them and all was basically coming at the cost of, if you recall, uh, I had this slide earlier in the course where the energy density or whatever, power density goes up and the, therefore the chip temperature goes up and I had that slide which showed rocket nozzle level temperature and nuclear reactor level thing. That obviously never happened, uh, but the thing is, if we had stuck with this, that paradigm of just boosting uh, frequency of a single processor, then that would have been the outcome. So all of these things, but multiple cores and all kind of really came out of came out of um, uh, that uh, that reality. Okay, so this is this this whole thing is referred to voltage scaling. Uh, of course, the problem is that uh, the good days of voltage scaling are kind of behind us, in the sense that. When these techniques started, then the voltages were around 5 volts and the threshold voltage was around maybe 1.5 volts. So we had a big headroom to play. Now we are at a stage where supply voltages kind of on a board and all are maybe 1.8 volt, 1.5 volt, something like that inside the processor, maybe 1.1, 1.2 and the threshold voltages are maybe like 0.9 volts or something. So our margins have just gone down. So there isn't a whole lot of headroom for us to play anymore, okay? There are techniques called sub-threshold logic and things like that that sort of people in circuits kind of work on. Uh, but again, main, main point is that uh, at least as a design time technique, there isn't a whole lot you can do anymore with this thing uh, because we are already pretty close to uh, sort of the lower voltage. As a runtime technique, there this still can work because uh, I can imagine that I may have some headroom of changing the voltage and frequency over a narrow band, okay, uh, and certain processors provide that and we're going to talk about that later. So this is voltage and frequency scaling. Yeah, go ahead. Oh. Okay, so firstly, I'm the wrong person to ask, uh, okay, because in the sense, so, so what is non-silicon at this stage? Uh, gallium arsenide chips, okay, I don't know anything about them, okay. Uh, they are higher power to begin with, so I assume that that's a lot. So essentially, the dominant technology is silicon-based. The question is non-CMOS, okay, so uh, are there other things? And yes, there's a lot of stuff going on now, carbon nanotube based transistors, uh, also some newer devices which are coming, the Spintronics, which is Professor Kang Wang's group works out here. So there are a bunch of other stuff happening. To be honest, I don't know what the power characteristics are and how to scale. So uh, I think I think that which device will win out is still kind of up in the air, and therefore these kind of issues haven't really been looked at seriously yet. Uh, but almost any system that we talk about has scaling capability. Whether the voltage is lower or not, the scaling kind of some extent or other does exist. Okay, so uh, let's switch perspectives a little bit and move to uh, uh, what can we do at runtime. Uh, so at runtime, basically, uh, uh, the choice we have, one choice we have is we can shut things down. So uh, when we don't need it, so a component or whole system can be powered off whenever no one is using it. And and since there is cost associated with shutting down and waking up, so I guess what we're really saying is we don't expect it to be used in the immediate future, okay? So if we somehow knew that, we can shut it down and then wake it up. So our ideal strategy would be, I wake up a component just before it is needed. And other times it is kept to sleep. Um, 
but even that may not be the best policy to do because if there is significant cost associated with shutting down and waking up then my non-use time should be long enough for it to be positive overall for me to do it or look at that so what happens in our systems then we kind of had two slides lecture on energy consumption where things have multiple power states so very common now is that uh, there may be multiple running states, even though I say one running state, multiple running states, so at different speeds, for example, and multiple shutdown states, which are different degrees of shutdown. So like, for ex uh, like when you shut down, what is retained? Uh, we had talked about that one of the issue is that state needs to be preserved. So the deeper I go into shutdown, more state needs to be preserved, and therefore the cost of shutdown sort of goes, goes up. And the delay in waking up will go up. So in a CPU, for example, uh, I may have uh, the simplest case would be just stop issuing instructions. Clock is still running and all, it's just a time I stop issuing instructions. Uh, turn off the clock circuitry, that would be the next step. So I still keep power on, registers preserve their state and all, but we just stop the clock, okay? Stopping the clock may be done by actually stopping the clock. More realistically, it's probably going to be gate the clock, okay? So put an AND gate and make one, one of the inputs to be zero and kind of just stop the clock feeding into the rest of the circuit. Uh, successively remove power from different parts of the CPU. So maybe if my CPU is super scalar, I shut down some, some of the instruction execution units. Maybe I can shut down parts of the cache. Maybe I can shut down some parts of the register bank. Maybe I can shut down some cores in the CPU. All, all these kind of things you can imagine uh, being, 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 being done. So deeper shutdown state, needless to say, will save more energy because uh, that's kind of the whole rationale behind them. But they will take longer to recommence and perhaps even longer to shut down because I have to save the state. So circuits take longer to uh, deeper the shutdown uh, the longer it would be taken, probably larger the energy cost to shut down and to wake up. So this approach is referred to in the literature as dynamic power management. The idea being that this is something we are kind of doing at runtime. Typically, as I said earlier on, something that the OS is going to be doing. So somewhere in the OS, deeply integrated with the um, uh, scheduler of the operating system would be this additional decision making as to what do we keep in what state. So you're also managing the power state uh, of the CPU, uh, power state of the system actually. So that's one thing we can do. The second thing we can do is to scale the performance. So this is the analog of what we just discussed. So the idea now is that I'm still running, but there are multiple run states and I'm kind of transitioning between them. So multiple run states would basically could correspond to, like in case of CPU, different frequencies. But there could be other notions of multiple run states. It could be I activate more amount of cache. Maybe I activate uh, more cores uh, uh, at a higher speed or a different type of core. So there are many different ways you can approach the performance scale. So the performance level can be lowered or raised based upon how we were using this thing, okay? That's kind of a concept out here. Uh, so in case of CPU, uh, very commonly found our ability to change the frequency. Change the frequency, changing the frequency by itself is not very effective as we saw uh, earlier in the course. So it's usually change the frequency in concert with changing the voltage. Um, it's possible for not just CPUs, but this concept works for radios and sort of other type of things and um, when we are talking about displays we had kind of talked about I can change the refresh rate, I can change the brightness. You can think of all of these things also in the same way in that we are essentially changing the performance uh, as a function of uh, so I can operate the display at a lower brightness and that's affecting the user happiness I guess. Uh, I can operate maybe my sensors at a higher noise level, lower, fewer bits of sensor sampling, save energy, but worse results. Uh, so there are many different ways you can scale the performance, but underlying all of them is this notion that somehow there is a power versus performance kind of knob which is taking place. So the task of the OS then is to kind of manage this 
and both these techniques may be present simultaneously and then kind of which one works better or not uh, better than the other kind of depends upon the type of system. So this is called DPM and this is usually in case of CPU called DVFS, dynamic voltage frequency scaling. By the way, uh, if both these techniques in a way are also related to the concept of energy proportionality we had discussed earlier. That is one of the ways we achieve an energy proportionality is by some combination of this thing. Okay? So performance scaling alone does not necessarily work because even at the lowest performance setting, since the CPU is still up, there would be significant baseline power consumption. So usually uh, to achieve system level energy proportionality, you are going to have combination of these two. So I may have multiple parts, which let's say multiple processors, they are being managed. Uh, some of them are kept up, some of them are kept down. So we use this part for that. And then those that are kept up, for them we do performance scaling. And then we do both of these together in an intelligent way so that my overall system, let's say a lack of servers or something like that, acts as, uh, acts as something which is energy proportional. Um, performance scaling in non-computing systems. Could you give me any examples of that? So remember, again, we have often talked about buildings, cars, stuff like that, and all. Do you think? Yeah, let's let's take cars. What would be an example of performance scaling? Are you aware of any example of performance scaling? Huh? No, no, no. Speed is an output. What is it in the system that we are scaling? No, 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 but all of those are at a given performance level of the system. Okay, so uh, not, not quite the same thing. I mean, what you're saying is, yes, uh, uh, more power is consumed when I'm running faster, right? But, I'm, but that is within the same system. Is there something I can do to the system to fundamentally change? So for example, there are some cars where the number of valves which are active in the engine can be changed. So what happens is uh, when you are at higher speed, uh, then it will act as a number of cylinders. So, six, so it might be a six cylinder or an eight cylinder engine. But when you are stopped, it will shut down some of the cylinders and you are down to like a two or three cylinder engine. Some, some of the GM cars and all are kind of like that. Okay, uh, So that's an example of this capability. That is, I am scaling the system to a lower operating point, okay, to a more efficient but less performance point. This one, running versus shutdown, again in cars, there is analogy, certain cars, at least, so in European Union, the mandate is that the car should automatically shut down when it is uh, waiting at a traffic light and all. So if you drive any European car, uh, then you would see that they, uh, if you reach a traffic light and you stop, and if if the car battery is in a state that it can, then it will shut the engine down, and then you lift the pedal off the accelerator, and then it sort of comes comes back up. So uh, in that case, when the car is not needed, uh, whatever the not the car, but rather the driving ability is not needed, it's automatically shutting it down. So the OS of the car is kind of doing that. Okay. Apparently they do, and the other part is Americans hate it. So they also provide a button out there to disable it, but the default is to keep it on. Okay. Uh, and so you have to explicitly disable it, and once you disable it for the rest of the ride, you are good. Uh, uh, so. Uh, and, and it of course depends upon the state of the battery. So what may also happen is that uh, after you have stopped for a long while, because long traffic light or whatever, then it will come back on. Okay, so it sort of uses in it battery as a battery as a buffer. Uh, whether it saves it or not, I don't know. Uh, but uh, cars have this thing. So, okay, so both these capabilities, right? I mean, one where kind of they are doing the performance scaling by changing the 
uh, your engine is no longer just a fixed number of cylinders, but it's actually changing the number of cylinders. It's, you can literally think of it as like the number of cores in the CPU being uh, up and okay. So that was cars. Any other system that you can think of? Yeah. It drives like an elephant. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. So they have an eco mode and super eco mode and then also sometimes they have a sport mode and a sport plus mode. So what they do in that is they change the whole curve. And I, I think I, I think you're right. Again, they are, that's an example of operating on a different curve altogether out here in terms of performance scaling. So they change the peak power available, but, uh, but the, uh, in return for shifting the whole curve. No, not quite. Not so much. <coughs> Buildings. So, of course, shutdown we see a lot, right? I mean, in a virtual hall, motion triggered, whatever. Uh, in AC systems and all now, so newer AC systems are so called multi stage systems. So, they have uh, as the load increases, then they inc uh, activate the extra load. So, that's an example of energy proportionality kicking in, basically. Uh -huh. Performance scaling uh, thing. So there are there are examples examples kind of abound of both these techniques and uh, and, and many 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 systems. Okay, and in fact, as you can imagine, all these ideas of like leakage and scaling and all they actually have analogs in all these uh, in, in all these systems. So the same theoretical framework ends up you know, applying nicely to both. Okay, so. Uh, now, of course, talking about optimizing for power or energy in the absence of any constraint is pointless. I mean, the surest way of being power efficient is to do nothing, right? But then that's not terribly useful. So we have to constrain something about the performance, okay? Um, so uh, I guess one way of thinking about it is that there is some performance level that is required and we must maintain it. So. It could take several forms. It's one very common form may be I have tasks, they have deadlines. Whatever you do for power management, make sure that the deadlines are not missed. Okay. And uh, again, those of you who are in 2 or 2A, we saw real time scheduling with deadlines and also you can imagine power efficient version of those schedulers, which basically make use of slack time to save energy, but they still make sure that the deadlines are not missed. So, uh, uh, so energy optimization uh, would be restricted to things where I can still kind of maintain the completion time. That's, that's, that's kind of the idea out there. Uh, in other cases, it's the throughput which is, has to be maintained. We saw that. Uh, so we are willing, we are saying that, okay, deadline can be sacrificed or at least for a large range, but throughput should be maintained. Okay, so uh, maybe, uh, so, so, so the examples I had earlier were the data part if we're going from 25 nanosecond to 50 nanosecond, uh, that 25 nanosecond increase in delay was acceptable, but throughput had to be maintained. So this is often the case in signal processing and media processing and these kind of systems where, uh, or, or if you are running a search server or some sort of server that you want to maintain the throughput because you make money by uh, serving customers. So you want to still serve customers at the same rate but you want to make, uh, but you are willing to sacrifice on the delay that an, any individual task may face. Uh, so services must operate, okay, so uh, this throughput notion is often very adequate. And in, in general, with this regime where throughput needs to be maintained but you are willing to sacrifice delay, there are a lot more opportunities for doing power optimization than this one because what happens in this one is that there may be some task which is particularly critical and that may just become the bottleneck task. You have to upgrade at a maximum performance for that, okay. So this this is a lot harder to achieve, uh, but then it's also sort of less common. Uh, this one is uh, more, uh, more, more commonly encountered. And then there are all sort of variants and all around these basic things that are available. So, uh, so required performance must be maintained, that's one thing. The other is that the demand may change, okay. Uh, so, um, 
uh, issues out here would be, for example, uh, I may say, I may say, for example, that throughput must be achievable with some latency. So that's sort of uh, some some throughput uh, and, uh, and some latency constraints simultaneously. Uh, I may also have things like uh, constraints for power. So I may say that you know, do whatever you want, but instantaneous power should never exceed something uh, some limit. So there are a bunch of other secondary variables that may also sort of come into come into play. So the tricky part out here is that workload of reasonably complicated systems are not known beforehand and moreover they change in time okay so when we are seeking to optimize for these things it's very hard to kind of have a static policy and say we just want to stick with it we have to kind of keep changing things at certain time so what would a solution look like so for a system to be able to do this kind of power management implicit in, uh, uh, there's an implied notion that the system has some model of power consumption of the system, okay? Because without that, it cannot effectively do this power management. If I have no idea on like how much power is an act, does the hardware consume in active state versus sleep state, let's say, uh, I won't know how to make the decision whether I should go to sleep or not, okay? So implied in this thing, therefore, is that uh, the system has some knowledge of how and where the power is consumed. What would be the effect of an action that we want to take? So that's just sort of uh, often overlooked, but this is why the power models that we were discussed uh, modules in the last one are important because uh, driving any policy has to be a power model. Uh, there must be some mechanism for the system to know what the performance requirements are for the workload or the task. Because if you do not specify any performance requirement, then again, the problem is ill-specified because as I said, then the system can, in theory, just choose to shut down and not do any work and that save all the power. So you have to specify something about what is acceptable uh, level of performance, whether it's throughput or latency or some other, other metrics, but there has to be something like this. The problem often occurs out here is the following, that most of our systems were not designed for applications to convey performance requirements, okay? So like, uh, let's, let's say I wrote a program and I'm running on my laptop and of course you write the program and run it. There is an implied expectation that it will run, but I never specified anything about its performance requirements. So a perfectly valid power management strategy for an OS would be, to shut down and not re return a result uh, at all because I never actually said that I needed a result within a certain amount of time. But there is obviously an implied expectation out there. Um, so in the absence of uh, in the absence of any explicit communication by the application that I need to run every 10 seconds or I need a latency of this, you need some other way of managing, uh, learning that. So. Some work in recent times have also made use of kind of the observation of the characteristics of the application. So what they do is, first they run the system in a mode where there's no power management, okay? But the OS keeps an eye on what the application is doing. Maybe like the application may be reading sensor data every 10 seconds, maybe uh, doing something, okay? So they observe the application's behavior in kind of an unperturbed state and then, and from that, they just kind of extract what it is behaving like, and then they do uh, power management so that that behavior is unperturbed. So even though the application never specified anything, by observing it, we kind of say that this is what the expectation is. And so it's almost like deriving the performance specification of the application by observing it, and that, that that's the fine approach. Um, so, uh, so this observation-based stuff is possible. Thirdly, there must be something that you optimize, right? Uh, some energy related metric because other, again, otherwise the problem is kind of pointless. If you, if, if there's no optimization criterion, I can choose to do nothing. So there must be, and, and, and there must be some algorithm underlying it. So there must be an energy optimizer. Some way of deciding whether, uh, what constitutes a better solution, okay? So it would have some, underlying resource management kind of a strategy there. Okay, so uh, 
uh, those are the three things. So power model. Yeah, so that's the system knowing how, uh, or uh, the power manager knowing how, what what the system characteristics are. So as I mentioned, uh, there are uh, components of the system or the entire system could be in many states. So one good way of thinking about the system is as if it's a dynamical system which has states and it moves among those states and those states correspond to our various run states and various uh, sleep or idle type states. So for example, uh, in, a, in case of a hard drive, you might imagine that I can think of the hard drive as being in one of three states. It's asleep, it is idle, and it is working. And then each one of these states could be characterized by a power number. So in this case, you see that while it is asleep, it's basically it's not spinning, 0.13 watts. When it is idle, 0.95 watts, it is spinning, but there is no active read and write happening. And then finally, when it is working, so actual read and write transaction <coughs> happening, then it's 2.2 watts. You might even imagine that perhaps I may could have split these things into two states for read and write. Uh, so there are sort of various possibilities out there. It could even be there are certain hard drives now. So going to the example of performance scaling, there are certain hard drives which can operate at a couple of different speeds. So 5400 and 7200. So they can dynamically kind of change change the speed. Uh, so that would introduce more states. So states are characterized by power. Transitions indicate what, uh, which state we can move from uh, or from into. And then transitions are annotated by a couple of metrics, couple of numbers, how much energy they take and how much time they take. Or equivalently, this may have time and power, okay. But the uh, point is that during that, uh, during that transition, so in this particular case, you see that spinning up takes 1.6 seconds, uh, spinning down takes 0.67 seconds, and I guess the notion out here is that before we sleep, we always go to an idle state. Okay, we don't immediately kind of go out here. Uh, uh, significant amount of like spinning up takes significant amount of energy because you are working up against uh, both the inertia and the static friction. Uh, uh, these things are presumably very low cost, so there is no additional energy or time number associated with this. Now, what is really happening is that the application is presenting some, or uh, whatever, the rest of the software is presenting some sort of a workload, right? There is some read job, some write job, those things are coming and the drive has to kind of handle them. And then within the hard drive would be some sort of a controller and that decides what is happening out here. So the OS controls and communicates with the hard drive controller and the hard drive controller actually manages kind of this, 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 this particular process. So from the OS perspective, there will be some configuration like for example, in, like in your laptop power management setting, you can say spin down the drive if idle or keep it up all the time. And kind of do those kind of configuration and the OS would uh, presumably configure the hard drive accordingly. And the second thing is based upon what's happening in the file system and kind of applications, uh, there is some read and write sort of commands, tasks being issued. So, uh, so this is how you can imagine a uh, hard drive being modeled. So more generally, for different components, we are going to have some state diagram like this. So power manageable components are going to expose their states through some sort of control knobs, some registers which the software can read or write from, uh, can read to and write from, and then they will define different kind of states. And they go under various kind of names like E states, P states, things like that. You see there's some standardization around it, but essentially various kind of states, some corresponding to work, states, some corresponding to uh, excuse me, the sleep states. So uh, this lower one is for a very old embedded processor. Um, so in this case, the processor could be running uh, as in doing active instruction execution. 
it could be idle, in which case usually there is some sort of an idle instruction and you kind of go there and do it. So essentially nothing is happening really. And then finally there is a sleep mode, in which case uh, a lot of stuff on the chip was shut down. And you would again see uh, that they are associated with a power number, almost half a watt out here, 50 milliwatt here, less than a milliwatt out here. There are transition time. Uh, so uh, it takes like 150 milliseconds to go from sleep to run because uh, clock needs to be brought up and stuff like that. Uh, a lot of other times are a lot shorter. So every, all, all, Every part of your system, you can kind of think in terms of these 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 different states. There may be uh, a complicated CPU may have ten substates like this. Okay, so it could be some sort of a complicated power power system. And essentially, the dynamic power management problem then is that we are getting tasks and using the knob that the component provides. The OS has to arrange for the component to move across these states. Okay, so that the tasks can be executed while meeting whatever performance requirements we had and optimizing for power. That's essentially kind of the overall, overall problem that we have. So do you think there are facets that are not modelable using this abstraction? Like this way of modeling power characteristics of a component or of a system, where does it begin to fail? Yeah. And what were you saying? Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think the real problem is what sort of Amrish pointing out. I mean, these things are very painstakingly. Like, uh, I mean, usually when you look at the data sheet, it's not obvious that you can derive these things. A lot of these numbers are kind of totally amiss. Okay. Um, uh, yes, uh, frequent transitions are an issue, but uh, that's more of a management issue. I can conceptually, I could still represent it this way, right? So it's not a representation issue, but frequent transitions uh, can can run counter, but if on the other hand, hardware is able to sustain them, why not? Like for example, out here, moving between these two states seem to be very rapid. So system can keep doing it all the time. It doesn't necessarily cost, cost us a whole lot. Uh, on the other hand, a transition like this, obviously is going to be very tricky, right? I mean, I, if, I, if I shut down and the next read or write request comes immediately, then I'm paying all this, like this round trip, is 4.8 joules, okay? Uh, and if it so happens that uh, I had nothing to do, I decided to go to sleep, and uh, 0.67 seconds later, after I decided, or whatever, I'm, I'm, I'm in, I just reached out here, and the next request came, and now I have to wake up, okay? So not only did I take a performance hit, but I also burned uh, 4.8 joules doing nothing, okay? Uh, so, so the issue out, uh, so, so, so this thing actually can help guide our transition. Should I shut down? That question can be answered with looking at diagonal uh, So, anyway, uh, what you can imagine the same kind of things being applied to non-computing systems, radios. I mean, these, these, these kind of things obviously work for radios and things like that as well. Wait, so what was the actual problem? Yeah, I mean, it's very hard to get these state, this kind of a state diagram easily, okay? I mean, you have to, um, I mean, uh, the, the requisite information is not easily available for, for the number part. The basic structure, you can always get. It may be very complicated. I mean, even, I mean, we used embed in the uh, in 202A. I mean, just that processor has uh, like order of 10 different power states, and that's kind of a relatively simple thing. <coughs> By the time you start looking at more complicated systems, it could be sometimes. And when you are looking at a system, the total number of states is very large because every component has 
similar model. So I have the hard drive, I have the CPU, I have the radio. Each one of them is independently controllable. So the total number of states is the product of them. So the overall power management policy can be hugely complicated. <coughs> Okay, so, uh, uh, so uh, uh, we are still sticking with that. Uh, when it came to the solution, we needed to know certain things. Okay, so so we looked at uh, the power model. The next thing we are going to look at is how the work constraints, workload constraints, and performance uh, come. Okay, so basic question is the following: How is the system to know? that the tasks are achieving their requirements, okay? And the issue out here is that uh, we can, uh, uh, that a lot of our systems are designed without giving the task an opportunity to specify uh, what the objectives are, okay? So uh, one approach is, like I said, this kind of a snoop at the behavior of the task. So let the tasks run. Uh, but uh, observe how it is using the resources, and from that you infer that that is what it wants. Okay, and uh, and then from that uh, you basically learn both kind of performance characteristics, and basically you try to preserve that. So essentially, what this approach essentially says is the following: that I am going to minimize the power consumption while causing no perturbance to how this application normally works when there was no power management. That's essentially what this approach boils down to. And so there is application is not explicitly conveying anything. Approach number two is that applications assess their own requirements and then convey that information through some sort of an API that the OS can provide and then the OS can do more aggressive resource management okay so for example so so this 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 approach would work where applications tend to be designed in a greedy fashion so what i mean by that is there are oftentimes applications which when more is given to them they'll figure out there is more and they'll transmit at a higher rate okay so uh, and when less is given to them they are still happy okay so the issue then is that if I were to just observe the with approach one, if I were to just observe their behavior in the normal state, we will think that they are very resource hungry applications and then basically lose the power management opportunity. But maybe the application has some slack to it. So uh, some sort of a more nuanced dialogue between the OS and the application can kind of help out there. So again, to kind of give you an example, uh, let's say we were writing something for the mobile phone and in the absence of anything, the application will say, aha, I have a fast network available. Let me send out the data now. It's available. Why not use it? But uh, that may be very power hungry. And if maybe applications true requirement were something slower or maybe even the communication could wait for later, then the OS may actually choose to defer that to a later point. So this former approach prioritizes performance over power, but then can miss out a lot of opportunities for power management. This latter approach has the problem that relatively few OSs were designed with a well thought out or rich enough way of communicating requirements. Okay, that is uh, what 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 is it that we are seeking? So. Uh, uh, so essentially, uh, OS is the one which is have to manage, but somehow it needs to know that what does what needs to be optimized, what needs to be preserved, and uh, somehow sort of that 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 information has to be conveyed to the OS or learned by the OS. Uh, another uh, part of the reason these, uh, so back to this approach, part of the reason these, uh, I said APIs don't exist and all. The issue also is that even when the APIs exist, they are often very hard to use. Uh, yeah, so that's that's kind of the other issue, which is it's very hard to convey complicated requirements. And also the requirements may be conveyed incorrectly. Okay, so these are all issues that come up also. Okay, so, so but nevertheless, we need, uh, obviously need something like this, and there are advocates on both these sides. Approach one says that let's just observe the native application performance and we seek to preserve it. Approach two says that, you know, that's not enough because uh, we really need to have the application be engaged in this process, indicate to us what performance it needs, stuff like that. 
finally, the third piece of the puzzle is that some sort of an optimization strategy. <coughs> so somehow the application, uh, somehow the OS, I guess I'm uh, taking that as an implied thing of this, that the OS will be adjusting those knobs that the various components, the hardware and all are exposing and what they are going to do uh, with the goal of optimizing some energy or power related metric while preserving some other performance related metric. So um, this is where there is a whole bunch of like perhaps thousands of papers have been written and gazillions of different techniques that exist. But very, very broadly, uh, heuristic approaches. So one approach basically says that you know it's the maximum performance which is the greenest. Okay, so this is kind of the equivalent of saying that I um, run as fast as you can to completion. Uh, okay, uh, so what? So essentially, underlying this thing is the intuition that things we do to maximize throughput are actually also the one which optimize for energy. Do you think it's true? Yeah. And as a general guideline, do you think it's a good strategy or a valid strategy? So the intuition is coming from, let's say, what do we do for maximizing performance of an algorithm? We minimize number of instructions it executes. So conjecture is, Fewer instructions, better for energy, um, greener, okay. Um, I run as fast as possible, I take less time, I'm greener, okay. So that's that's the driving intuition, okay. Is it all true? And we already saw it was not true for those data path examples. Uh, let's look non-computing. Do you think if I am going from here to home, and let's say cops permit, if I drive at 100 miles per hour versus 20 miles per hour, I mean my car probably has some sweet spot in terms of things. So driving at the peak capacity often comes at a uh, much, much higher penalty. Okay, so as a general strategy, it's obviously kind of not true, but nevertheless, uh, in a lot of operating regimes, people sort of believe this thing. So you will often see this kind of approach that let's optimize for performance, greenness follows from. So it's basically race to sleep or race to idle strategy. Okay. It holds true when power is, I guess I forgot to write something. Can you help me finish? So power would need to have some sort of a nicely shaped curve, right? I mean, so yeah, that's what. So anyway, that's one strategy. Maximum performance is the green. Second one is we adjust hardware performance level dynamically based upon its current utilization. So kind of the idea is that if um, if the CPU is very, uh, is the utilization is low, I'm going to reduce its frequency. If the CPU utilization is high, I'm going to increase its frequency, perhaps even activate another CPU, things like that. So we constantly monitor what is happening to the thing and keep adjusting, keep adjusting uh, the hardware resources accordingly. So, downward or upward uh, modification based upon utilization. Uh, so, uh, main thing out here is that uh, so, so it's a good strategy in the sense that doing anything else is going to be uh, in general not very good, but not always, right? So, for example, um, let's say utilization was low you would still face two choices. One is I slow down the CPU, okay, slow the frequency, and which will incur cost when you change the clock frequency and all, it's not an instantaneous process, there's some overhead, but let's say that's tolerable. Or the other is you can say, you know, I'm gonna stick with the maximum possible uh, speed and race to idle and then shut down. And the third possibility is that if I have a big dot little type architecture, I transition thing to a uh, lower capability CPU, which would have a higher utilization. All of these transitions take, have have a cost associated with it. So, uh, but that's kind of a general second class of strategy that you would, uh, that you would see. 
Then there are methods and lots of them which basically seek to model these things into some sort of a very formal optimization uh, optimization approach. Um, uh, and uh, optimize for what, what what would be the best strategy. So they kind of, uh, there are results, some of which we will see that how should we transition between states or when should we move from one active state to another, which sleep state should we pick. Uh, there are a variety of results, both uh, techniques which are static in the sense they come up with a good policy and stick with it as well as techniques which are dynamic which is constantly they look at the mix of tasks and essentially at runtime solve some sort of an optimization problem to keep coming up with it and so on. Um, so uh, more complicated schemes sort of exist as well and we're going to look at some of them. Now supporting them by the way these schemes these energy optimization schemes are PC type systems and all can either exist at the OS level or sometimes they exist at the BIOS or the HAL level, okay? Or if you have a newer machine, they have these UEFI based BIOSes or whatever uh, things that are a lot more complicated, they have a lot more power features and all. So what the platform needs to provide is then some way to let the software control these states. And that is where comes this, uh, thing called ACPI, Advanced Configuration and Power Interface. Anyone heard of it? I mean, you probably see these things. It's in the device manager. Yeah, it's in the device manager window and all. So, so the reason it, uh, it's, it's been around for a while, okay? So, the, the, uh, so it's basically uh, standard in Intel architectures, um, other than, uh, or at least on Linux and Windows side of things. I think in case of Apple, it's definitely like that. So, uh, previous, so early on, so, so when power management first came into being and all, it was done at the uh, BIOS level using some early approaches or something called advanced power management and things like that. Okay. Uh, but eventually kind of uh, things got uh, uh, standardized and kind of the idea was that any OS that was ACPI compliant can then manage that platform. So essentially ACPI is provided by motherboard vendor, so to say, and this was standardized by Intel, and then OSs which know about ACPI can kind of work with this. And what this thing does is it defines this notion of power state, kind of that state diagram that I talked about. Uh, it has a whole bunch of different types of states, local state, device state, operating system, and we're going to talk briefly about them. Um, but what it does is it basically exposes these knobs to the OS. So the OS can now figure out what components there are, what their capabilities are, and then kind of work with them. So essentially, uh, it becomes part of the abstraction that the platform provides, and the OS doesn't need to kind of come uh, deal, with, deal with those details. Uh, so uh, once, um, platform as ACPI, then the actual management in them is then being done by the ACPI. And what the OS is doing is deciding the policies, basically saying, turn this thing off, or it can get to know what the possible states are, what has the characteristics also and all. So ACPI, therefore, uh, is an enabler, but in itself, the decision making is not there for, uh, into ACPI. There are issues around it also. Um, uh, so internally, it basically relies on sort of a bytecode based uh, code. So there's some sort of uh, security concerns surrounding this thing that is you can actually inject uh, malware and all through these things and all also. So uh, there's a code by Linus Trouble that this, this was a total disaster. And I guess early uh, earlier era of AC, uh, uh, of, of these things were written with issues. I mean, despite the standard being there, power management in Linux and Windows was always kind of a rather painful. Things won't wake up. Things would not shut down properly. Things like that. So it took a long while for it to kind of um, uh, for it to kind of stabilize. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop out here uh, ten minutes early because the discussion on states on ACPI is going to take longer. So uh, the next uh, thing we'll go, we'll go into is what these states are, uh, how, how are things structured and all. I'm also uh, going to talk a bit about how power management gets done in Linux.
uh, to as an example. Um, I'm sure there is there are equivalent things that happen in OS X and Windows, but I have less public material about them, so we're going to sort of talk just about this. Um, so anyway, uh, so next week's plan is that Tuesday's lecture will continue on this. Thursday, the three of you who are assigned are going to be talking. Okay. And again, if you haven't seen the email on Piazza, I posted kind of the papers that are due, uh, whose reviews are due next Thursday. Okay.